All right, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to our third video for Unit 2, Area Study 1, Economic Growth and Sustainable Development. Today, we're going to be talking about aggregate demand, what aggregate demand is, how aggregate demand impacts economic growth, as well as a little bit of aggregate supply, this, as well as aggregate supply. Like this ends up being a little bit bigger overall compared to um, some of the other videos. So bear with me. Um, some of this you'll already know if you've already been in my class and you've learned a little bit about aggregate demand already. But if not, we're gonna go through everything. I have another video that explains aggregate demand in more detail. If you'd like to check that out, I will put the link in the description below. So let's get straight into it. So when we talk about economic growth, we talk about the business cycle. Um, this basically measures economic activity over time. As you can see, um, the two axes here are the level of real output, which is GDP essentially, and time. So as you can see, like if you look at it in detail, you can see that over time, as time goes on, the level of output is growing and going up. But it's not constantly going up. We're just hoping that on average it's going up. Um, the reason it's called the business cycle is it goes in cyclical waves. So it goes up and down and up and down. And there are five different phases of it. So there's expansionary phases, which are when you are increasing, which is these points here. There are contractionary phases, which is when the economy is contracting. And there are peaks when we are at the max, when we're growing a whole lot. Usually also means that inflation's high and unemployment's really low. And there are troughs where we are at the low point. Usually inflation's really low, unemployment's high, and growth is really low. And we're hoping that over time, we are going to average out into what we call um, what's on the next slide, domestic economic stability, which is where we have an average growth of 3 to 3.5 per year. Unemployment's usually low, around 4.5%, and inflation's within the goal range of 2 to 3%. It's the ideal position to be in because when those three things are being satisfied, it means that we are actually, as an economy, going to be growing at the correct rate that's not going to cause any other like issues. Like, prices aren't going to be too high, which is great because it means people have more purchasing power, they can better satisfy themselves and have better living standards. Unemployment's low, people aren't unemployed, therefore the living standards are higher. Growth is happening at a good rate, so therefore goods and services are actually available to everyone. So that's what we want to be in, like that's what we are striving to achieve through economic growth. So to talk about this, we talk about factors that impact economic growth. There are two different sides that are impacted, aggregate supply side, which alter resources available for production along with business costs and profits and the economy's long-term productive capacity or potential level of GDP. Aggregate supply side, whenever you hear the words aggregate supply, these things only impact businesses. So only businesses, as I write businesses in some really crude freehand with a trackpad. I'm probably gonna spell businesses wrong now. They only impact businesses. So aggregate supply boils down to two things. They impact either a business's cost of production or their efficiency. And boils down to those two things all of the time. And anything that affects those is going to be aggregate supply side. So if you ever hear about wages, that is aggregate supply side because that is a cost of production for businesses. Aggregate demand side is all about the consumer. And what that means is it's all about things that impact the amount that consumers are spending on goods and services. And if aggregate demand increases, that is usually because it means consumers are spending more money and therefore that creates more demand for goods and services, which leads to businesses producing more because they wanna meet that demand. So aggregate demand side factors alter the levels of national spending on GDP and the extent to which the economy's productive capacity is actually used in the short term. So essentially, um, when we talk about this, it's like, well, what could happen that would make consumers want to spend more? One easy one to talk about is if income tax is decreased. If people are paying less tax, they've got more disposable income and they'll use that income to buy more goods and services. They'll probably save a little bit of it. They might import some things with it, but for the most part, they're probably going to buy more goods and services. Like a lot of people, when they get a pay rise, the first thing they do is buy some dumb stuff they don't need. That's good for the economy. So well done to those people. So when we talk about that, it gets into this big overwhelming model. And like, if you were in my classroom, what we'll do is we do this step by step. Um, it's a lot harder to do that with PowerPoint. So um, hopefully, well, you would have in unit one, looked at the two sector circular flow model. We looked at the flows that occur between the household sector 
and business sector. So if you did that, it would just ignore this whole bottom section here, which is good, we'll ignore that for now as well. So to recap what you should already know, there are a bunch of different transactions that occur between households and businesses. So households provide resources to businesses through their um, land, labor, and capital. So we sell resources to them. Most of the time it's labor. That's the easiest example. Sometimes we might rent property to them so they can use it for their business. And what do businesses give households in return? Well, they give us incomes in return. So they either pay rent, they pay us a wage, or they um, might give us dividends, etc., like shares of their profits. So that money goes back to the household sector. So how we've got this so far is it goes from the household sector to businesses, then it comes back to the household sector. And then what happens is, for the most part, the majority of our money goes towards private consumption spending, which is basically just spending money on goods and services. About 70% of our income goes to private consumption spending. That could be paying bills, petrol, groceries, odds and ends, all those kind of things. The majority of our spending goes there. But not all of our spending goes there. Sometimes we do some other things with it. So there are other ways that our money um, is spent. And basically this is just showing the fact that not all money goes directly to businesses. So sometimes some of our money, we save it. If you're smart, you're hopefully saving some money if you have a job, because that's gonna be helpful at some point in time. And so savings is money that's not contributing to um, the economy. One important thing about savings is it's money that's not being spent right now. It's not leaving the economy but it is not being spent right now. Eventually, you're gonna use your savings to buy something and it will become private consumption spending. But right now, it's what we refer to as a leakage. This whole side is what we call leakages, if I was to write that down here, which basically just means that either money is leaving the economy or not being spent right now. So the one under that is another example of that, government tax. So if you earn over a certain amount, you pay tax on your income and Tax is money you can't spend right now. And the government takes that, but they don't spend it right away either. The government spends their money later on. So in the short term, tax doesn't really impact the economy. So that's another way that it's not a leakage. Money is either leaving the economy or not being spent now. And then lastly, one thing that you probably love to do is import spending. And so import spending is actually money just straight up leaving our economy. So you're buying something from overseas, and that money is going straight to a foreign economy. It's not helping in Australia. It's not doing anything for jobs here. It's not doing anything for growth here. You're buying something from overseas, probably because it's cheaper or there's more choice, but that is money that is leaving the economy. So these three things on the left here are known as leakages because they're essentially things that are either money leaving the economy or not being used for current consumption. On the right here, we have what we call injections. And this is money that from, is coming from outside sources and benefiting the economy. So we'll write that down at the bottom here, injections. And the first one is private investment spending. So private investment spending is when businesses uh, borrow money to invest in capital and equipment or to invest and expand. And that is positive for the economy because that's money coming in that is gonna create more spending. So it's very positive. So it's businesses borrowing money to invest and expand. Then we've got government spending. Government spending is essentially when the government starts using that tax revenue that they've um, gotten to spend on infrastructure, um, could be roads, could be buildings, could be bridges. They might be like giving funding to certain areas. That's gonna really positively benefit the economy because it's money coming into it that is gonna create more demand. And then lastly, we've got export spending, which is other countries buying our goods and services. Well, that's money coming to Australia from overseas. That is very, very positive. So all of these things together in the bottom part, um, in your original two sector circular flow model, these would have just been listed, this would have just been listed as the total demand for goods and services, still essentially what it is. It's what we call aggregate demand, which is the um, essentially the value of um, consumption, investment, government spending, and exports minus imports. It's all those things added together gives us essentially a dollar value of all the demand for goods and services in the economy. What you might notice is that when we have that equation, it's ignoring government tax and savings. If we were just to draw over those right now, 
The reason why it ignores those is because they're not actually, they don't need to be included because they're not leaving the economy. We don't need to take them away. Just they're not being used right now. So eventually they are going to contribute, but we don't need to include them right now. And so when we've got the total level of aggregate demand, what happens, what do businesses do? Well, they respond by creating those goods and services, which ends up being flow for the production of all goods and services, or also known as GDP. And those goods and services go to the households. Businesses then need to be able to produce more goods and services, so they demand resources from households and it flows on and on and on forever. And so that's essentially what the five sector circular flow model is. It's essentially how all the spending occurs in the economy and how that leads to production occurring. Um, this goes on into a little bit more detail into the different sectors that exist. So we've got the household sector who supply resources, the business sector who produce the goods and services, the financial sector, which is things like banks, building societies, the stock exchange and life insurance companies that either collect or borrow savings from individuals and lend credit to businesses wanting to undertake expansion. Um, we've got the government sector, which includes the activities of federal, state and local governments, and they collect various types of tax from those earning income and then use that to pay for the government spending and the provision of goods and services to the community. And we've got the overseas sector, which is just where all the imports and exports take place. Uh, the four flows to explain the diagram. So if you need more detail on this, you can pause here and read through them, but we've already explained them in detail through that model. So in looking at the factors that impact these things, so what essentially happens when you answer questions about aggregate demand, you need to talk about how certain components of aggregate demand are impacted and then the overall effect that it has on aggregate demand. So one of the most common ones you'll talk about is how private consumption spending changes if it increases or decreases based on a number of factors. So the following changes affect consumption spending. So the levels of disposable income, if that changes, private consumption spending will change and then aggregate demand will change. Consumer confidence. Consumer confidence is how consumers feel about, how optimistic they feel about future employment, incomes, etc. If they feel confident, they'll spend more money. So private consumption spending will increase and aggregate demand will increase. Savings rates. If people are saving more, they're spending less. Interest rates. If interest rates are low, people will borrow and spend more money. Therefore, aggregate demand will increase. The rate of population growth. If there are more people, there's more spending. And budgetary policies, the things the government does, like if they change taxes and how that affects spending. Things that affect investment spending. Business confidence. If businesses are confident, they'll invest and expand. Therefore, more aggregate demand. Interest rates. If interest rates are low, more borrowing will occur, more investment and expansion, more aggregate demand. Company tax rates, if they're higher, businesses won't invest as much and therefore aggregate demand will be lower. Discoveries of new natural resources, businesses will invest more if they know there's more resources for them to use and therefore increase aggregate demand. Technological developments, if businesses know that they can be more efficient with new technology, they might invest in it and therefore increase aggregate demand. Retail sales trends, I dare say towards the holiday season each year, businesses may invest a little bit more and changes in stock levels of unsold goods. So at the moment, businesses are probably investing less because they've got so much stock left over that they're just trying to get rid of it. Government spending. So things that affect the levels of government spending, the level of unemployment, the more unemployment there is, the more welfare businesses have to, I mean, the more welfare government has to pay. The level of inflation. If inflation is too high, the government needs to slow spending down. If it's too low, they need to stimulate it. The impact of pressure groups and election promises, the speed of population growth and financial considerations. That last point has been important for a while. Our government's been in, in, so in deficit for quite some time. And at some point they need to pay that debt back. So they may cut spending in times where they're trying, they've been trying to for a long time, and haven't been able to because of the issues in the wider world, but um, they'll try and be more, uh, what's the word? Um, a little bit more careful in their spending in future because we don't want to have too much foreign debt that could cause issues in the long term. Things that change export spending. So the exchange rate. Currently our exchange rate is quite low, which means our exports are cheaper to overseas countries, which makes them want to buy them, which is good. Overseas economic conditions is bad though at the moment because of Corona and COVID, um, our exports aren't as selling as much because countries do not want to buy them because things have slowed down. Change in local production costs, efficiency, and competitiveness. 
the cheaper your production costs are, the more competitive you are, the more likely it is you'll be able to export more because you're more competitive with overseas countries. Trends in world commodity prices, weather conditions, and economic policies of overseas and local governments. That last one's a big one at the moment. China um, is having a little bit of trade issues with Australia at the moment where they put 80% tariffs on our barley. Therefore, it makes it a lot harder to trade our barley because they don't want to buy it because it costs 80% more. Things that affect import spending, the exchange rate. So the higher the exchange rate is, the more we import. I was lucky enough to live through the time where our dollar was worth a dollar ten US and buying things from America would actually be cheaper by far, which was a, quite a time to be alive. Quite the opposite now, with the dollar being about 70 US cents, costs a lot to import things from overseas and therefore you're probably doing a lot less of it. Australian government policy can imp impact import spending. So now you have to pay GST on imports above a certain value, which de-incentivizes people from importing goods and services. Trends in local economic conditions, so things are slowing down at the moment, people are actually importing less because they're worried about their future incomes. Consumer and business confidence and the inflation rate relative to overseas. And then some aggregate supply side factors, so things that impact aggregate supply overall. So these really boil down to two main points anything that impacts your cost of production or your overall efficiency. So these get into a bit more detail, but they all boil down to one of those two points and I'll write it next to them as we go. So the development of natural resources. So if we have more natural resources, that is gonna um, make you more efficient because you're more able to produce. Uh, we've got climate change and severe weather events. That's gonna affect your um, productivity or efficiency and it can also affect your cost of production because if we have less resources, you are not going to be able to produce as much. Uh, the level of research and development, if you are successful in research and development, you should be able to get more out of the resources that you're putting into production. And therefore that can actually you can do both. It can make you more efficient, getting more output per unit of input, and that actually lowers your cost of production as well. Developing capital resources through business investment, it's essentially the same description as research and development. The quantity of labor available, if there's lots of labor available, labor will be cheap. If the labor is scarce, it's gonna drive the wage prices up and will bring up your cost of production. Government provision of infrastructure, if the government is providing like suitable, like enough roads, so it's not traffic issues, etc., that can make businesses more efficient. How productive labor is, workers and managers adopting the world's best practices and any government microeconomic efficiency reforms. We refer to those as aggregate supply side policies where they might change like business tax, they might change, they might give benefits to firms who do research development, which is currently a 45% tax offset. Um, they might offer benefits to businesses who do research and development, um, all those kind of things, which is really beneficial. So aggregate supply side factors are anything that affects either the cost of production or efficiency for businesses. All right, that's essentially it for this area of um, this topic. Hope this is helpful to you. If you need any help with any of it at all, feel free to either send a comment below, send me an email or um, message any way possible. I'm more than happy to help. Um, on that, next up, we are going to start looking at how the um, government influences economic growth, the things they put in place, how budgetary policy and monetary policy, which is um, the government spending and interest rates impact the overall level of growth. On that, I hope you have an excellent day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.